as people of faith, and we are faith, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it. We don't have a lot of bells and smells, as they say. <laughs> we don't have a creed, necessarily. But we do share values of peace and freedom and tolerance with so many faiths. And so it's important that we stand in solidarity with our fellow co-religionists. So, thank you. Our meditation this morning comes to us from Jane Zepka. We are waiting for the sun to show its strength. The winter is too long and spring seems to trifle with us. The everyday cold has made us tired. Our neighbors and children and co-workers tired. We are waiting to rise from the dead. Who is not ready for the poetry of spring? The forsythia that blooms overnight the digging, the surprise of the lengthening day. May we savor the air as it grows warmer and easier to breathe. May we love the earth again. While we wait once more for the sun to show its strength, may we care for one another. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose <coughs> in the winter time. There was a time when a rose in winter was a paradox. It was a magical, mystical thing. And of course, these days, they're flown in from Mexico or Colombia, which is a miracle of another sort. So a rose in the winter time is now simply unremarkable. But in speaking to us from another time, the line reminds us that things were not always as they are now. And that our history as a country has layers and depths with mythical threads running through it. And like all mythical things, it contains paradoxes and multitudes. In the early days of our country, it was primarily personified in the goddess-like figure known as Columbia. The name Columbia is a neo-Latin name in use since the 1730s for the 13 colonies. It comes from Christopher Columbus with an IA on the end, which was common in Latin names of countries. And there are and were many like her. The British Britannia, the Swiss Helvetica, the French Marianne. And she was often called Lady of Columbia or Miss Columbia. Her image was never completely consistent, but she was usually presented as a woman between youth and middle age, wearing classically draped garments decorated with stars and stripes. Her headdress varied sometimes included feathers reminiscent of indigenous headgear. Other times it was a laurel wreath, but most often it was a cap of liberty, the soft red cap, the floppy top. She was virtuous and compassionate. Sometimes she was sternly maternal. Sometimes she offered a warm embrace. In her martial aspect, she wielded a sword and carried a shield. And sometimes she carried the flag. The political cartoonist in the late 1800s, now Thomas Nash, used her to represent the nation's conscience. One of his illustrations had her protecting a Chinese immigrant from an angry Irish mob. Another had her standing with an injured African-American soldier and asking why he is not being given the vote for his sacrifice during the Civil War. In 
like many such f national female personifications, her roots traced back to Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and warfare. And like all goddesses, her help is invoked in times of need, as in this 1775 poem by the African-American poet Phyllis Wheatley, entitled, To His Excellency George Washington. It's a little bit long, but I think it's worth a listen. Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. While freedom's cause her anxious breast alarms, she flashes dreadful in refulgent arms. See Mother Earth her offspring's fate bemoan, and nations gaze at scenes before unknown. See the bright beams of heaven's revolving light involved in sorrows and veil of night. The goddess comes, she moves divinely fair. Olive and laurel bind her golden hair. Wherever shines this native of the skies, unnumbered charms and recent graces rise. Muse, bow propitious while my pen relates how pour her armies through a thousand gates, as when Aeolus, heaven's fair face, deforms Enwrapped in tempest and a night of storms, astonished ocean feels the wild uproar. The refluent surges beat the sounding shore, or thick as leaves in autumn's golden rain, such and so many moves the warrior's train. In bright array they seek the work of war, how high unfurled the ensign waves in air. Shall I to Washington their praise recite? Even thou knowest them in the fields of fight. Thee, first in honors, peace, we demand. The grace and glory of thy martial band, famed for thy valor, for thy virtues more. Hear every tongue thy guardian aid implore. One century scarce performed its destined round when Gallic powers Columbia's fury, found, Columbia's fury found. And so may you, whoever dares disgrace the land of freedom's heaven-defended race. Fixed are the eyes of nations on the scales, for in their hopes Columbia's arm prevails. Anon Britannia droops the pensive head, while round increase the rising hills of dead. Cruel blindness to Columbia's state, lament thy thirst of boundless power too late. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Let every action, let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with gold unfading. Washington, be thine. In the end, Washington rejects both crown, or rejects crown, palace, and throne. But not the poem, or apparently the help of the divine feminine. In a letter to the poet, Washington addresses her as Miss Phyllis and signs it, your humble, obedient servant. Unheard of courtesies to a woman only recently a slave. She'd been freed two years earlier. But perhaps Washington feared offending the goddess in whatever form she took. Columbia became a symbol of the women's suffrage movement. And women dressed as Columbia accompanied many a demonstration for women's voting rights. Rivers, cities, and ships, and ultimately spacecraft bore her name. The 
United States also has a male personification around during all this time. He first appears as Brother Jonathan, a young, cunning, and cultured trickster, who then takes on a dual identity as Uncle Sam after the War of 1812. By the end of the 19th century, Brother Jonathan has disappeared and Uncle Sam takes over. Not as a male personification of America, but as the white and white-haired symbol of the U.S. government. But for a period, Uncle Sam and Columbia exist side by side as complementary icons for many years. There's one famous Thomas Nast illustration from 1869 where they seem almost parental in their roles. At a Thanksgiving dinner with Uncle Sam at one end of the table carving the turkey, and Columbia at the other end. And joining them are Americans from all over the world, German, Native American, French, Arab, British, African, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, and Irish. And the placement of Columbia between a black man and a Chinese man is significant because it represents Nast's consistent support of their civil rights and his opposition to the violence and discrimination inflicted on them. The cartoon also has the specific aim of ratifying the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which was intended to guarantee that federal voting rights could not be denied on the basis of race. But Columbia does not endure. With the French gift of the Statue of Liberty, Columbia begins her slow decline as the feminine symbol of the United States, which transforms that symbol from an active agent, from a dynamic role to a passive one, into a frozen figure of bronze who no longer wears the cap of liberty, but a crown. Lady Liberty has her own classic heritage as a Roman goddess. From the very start, the founders of the United States had a fascination with things Roman. The imperial eagle was the national symbol. The use of the term Senate to describe the upper house of Congress. And in the naming of parts of the District of Columbia, after Capitoline Hill in Rome, these are all deliberate uses of Roman precedents to establish America as its own empire. Because it's around this time that the U.S. starts to flex its imperial muscles. Late 18th century, in quick succession, America purchases Alaska, annexes Hawaii, starts and finishes the Spanish-American War annexes or intervenes in the Philippines and literally creates the nation of Panama in order to build the Panama Canal. And not too many years later, the United States enters the Great War. And posters featuring Columbia exhort young men to enlist and the public to buy bonds and plant war guards. After the First World War, Columbia's presence in American life almost completely disappears. Historians debate the reasons. Perhaps it was the horror of that war that caused people to turn away from Columbia. Perhaps the Statue of Liberty took her place. Perhaps it was a reaction to the success of the women's suffrage movement. I think it's because an empire cannot afford the luxury of a conscience or to be reminded that virtue is a desirable thing. But whatever the cause, there is no doubt that between the bloody Civil War and the brutal war and brutal World War I, we could no longer make a claim as a nation to any innocence at all. 
And in the years that follow, Uncle Sam dominates as the personification of the United States as both a figure of some nobility and as a figure of ridicule. And what we see in all this is the way that symbol and myth change over time. In a sense, both Columbia and Uncle Sam are relics of a bygone era. The modern masculine personification of the United States seems to be a portly businessman smoking a cigar. And I'm not sure if there is a modern feminine personification of the United States. Lady Liberty still stands, but her reputation is tarnished as of late, no doubt due to the bad company she's been keeping. Why is this important? Because how people see themselves and how they portray, excuse me, how they portray themselves is critical. Because without unifying myths and symbols, they are not one. Can a people thrive without a goddess or goddesses? I think not. It's a question of balance and wholeness. <clears throat> I find it significant that the feminine personification of our country had many aspects of a goddess, or at the very least a demigoddess, and that the male personification is largely a caricature of the apparatus of government or business. There's a deep discordance there when it's still reflected in our political divide. I suppose we could reduce this to the patriarchy versus the nanny state, but it's more complex than that. And it's not easily resolved via politics or intellect. It's not a problem to be solved, but a riddle to be answered, or perhaps a koan to be pondered. Let's return to that rose in winter. In ancient Greece, the rose was closely associated with the goddess Aphrodite. In the Iliad, Aphrodite protects the body of Hector using the immortal oil of the rose. The second century AD Greek writer Basanias tells us that the rose is red because Aphrodite wounded herself on one of the thorns and stained the flower red with her blood. In the book 11 of the ancient Roman novel, The Golden Ass, contains a scene in which the main character, Lucius, who has been transformed into a donkey, must eat rose petals in order to regain his humanity. Let's unpack that last story. <laughs> Lucius has turned himself into an ass. <laughs> it wasn't done to him. In his youthful desire to practice magic, which is to say to wield power, he attempts to transform himself into a bird. The spell goes wrong and poof, he's a beast. Many hijinks and diversions ensue. <laughs> too many to relate here, but Lucius the ass is variously stolen, sold, stolen again, and finally escapes to a beach on the Aegean Sea, where he beseeches the Queen of Heaven in all her names, Venus, Ceres, Paphos, Porcelain, Minerva, for a return to his human form. And the Queen of Heaven, manifesting as Isis, appears in a vision and explains to him how he can regain his original body by eating the crown of roses that will be held by one of her priests during a religious procession the following day, <coughs> which he does, and so regains his original form and in return for his deliverance, vows to serve Isis and become initiated as her priest. So Lucius must take the goddess in the form of rose petals into his animal body so that it becomes part of his own being. 
and it makes him whole again. The lesson is rather heavy-handed. Without the moderating influence of the divine feminine, men are animals. But let's not forget that the reverse is also true. <laughs> Where are the rose petals that Uncle Sam must eat to restore balance and humanity to our nation? There's our riddle. And of course you can lead Uncle Sam to roses, <laughs> but you cannot make him eat. He must want to eat them. He must feel a different hunger, a hunger for beauty and virtue, not power. These myths and symbols, these personifications, have great influence in our lives. And they're not easy to manipulate or manage, either from the grassroots up or the top down. They have lives of their own, lives that we can starve and deny, or nurture and affirm. But it seems clear to me that the divine feminine is stirring in the soul of our nation once again. Young women are leaders in the climate movement and other justice struggles. More women are running for and winning political office. And we have the largest number of women ever to sit in our House of Representatives. And we need more to restore the balance from city councils to Capitol Hill. Perhaps Columbia will rise again. Perhaps she will take another form, another name, or take on many other colors and shapes and garments and many names as in the ancient world. But however she manifests, let us strew her path with flowers. And let's keep on offering that crown of roses to Uncle Sam, because he desperately needs to change his diet.